All right, here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Divulgence. I'm very happy for you to be here. I'm Jordan Bezo, and today I welcome a Canadian author who has written numerous books on Camp X, which is the subject that we're going to be talking about today. Some of his books include Inside Camp X, as well as The Birth of Special Operations in Canada. They are both excellent books that I've read recently. Both were awesome reads and I highly recommend them and it's a very interesting topic so I'm very happy to bring in Lynn Philip Hodgson. Hello Lynn how are you today? Very well and you? I'm doing well thank you. Thank you so much for coming in I appreciate it it's great to have you. I'm glad to be here. So you have a presentation for us so I'm just going to pull that up. All right Lynn so why don't you tell us about Camp X? Well, it starts out starts out 45 years ago. Actually, there were a couple of things that happened back in the 1960s. A man named H. Montgomery Hyde wrote a book called The Quiet Canadian. And in that book, it was about Sir William Stevenson. <clears throat> and in that book, it, he slipped a few things out that people weren't aware of. And uh, the press picked up on it and created uh, quite a... Uh, kerfuffle with, uh, within the press. And after that, a number of things started to, to leak out. And then, of course, Stevenson commissioned William Stevenson, the author, to write his memoirs in, in his book, which, which was a huge bestseller. came in 1976, a man called Intrepid. So after that, I got interested in Camp X because my, my wife was reading it at the time. And uh, so I, I read it after her and then got interested in the subject. And fortunately for me, back in the 1970s, uh, a lot of these people who uh, went through Camp X, staff and agents and guards, etc., instructors, they were all still at a, a fairly young age of, of in their 60s. So they had their faculties about them. And it was quite easy to, uh, to interview them. The problem, of course, was that it was still a top secret uh, subject, and that was the, that, that was the most uh, difficult uh, part of the whole thing for me in doing the research and uh, for my books. So, but one of the questions that came up, and, and I never was able to find it in any of the books that have been previously published, and that was what. What caused someone to create this special camp right here in Canada on the shores of Lake Ontario? Why that location? And it was over the years that I was able to put pieces of the puzzle together. And I came up with the fact that it was the Battle of Britain. The Battle of Britain, of course, was a huge problem for Sir William Stevenson. It, it appeared that the Germans were going to occupy Great Britain, as they had done with so many other countries before, before that. And uh, he, he did a number of things in, in uh, desperation. Two very, very important issues. That was the one, the creation of the SOE, the Special Operations Executive. So in June of 1940, during that Battle of, uh, of Britain, he created this secret organization. He put two men in charge, and that way it was easier for him to have these two men reporting directly to him. One was Sir Colin Govins was, was put in charge of, of Europe, and uh, Sir William Stevenson was put in charge of the Americas. And uh, in doing so, Stevenson, of course, was very, very anxious to, uh, to get going, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But the other thing he did was he, in desperation again, set sail a number of British destroyers with $8 billion in British gold bullion. It was the complete reserves of, of Great Britain, all of its gold, came over on a number of ships and into the port of Halifax, unloaded under the cover of darkness onto trucks, and then sent to the Sun Life building in, in Montreal, where it was stored in the basement for the duration of the war. And that was a very, very controversial move because, of course, $8 billion in gold is probably worth $8 trillion today. And if the Germans had been successful in sinking the ships, it would have been disastrous, of course, for Great Britain. So Stevenson came over back to the, to the United States, 
because he wanted to be close to New York and, and Washington, where he was going to be spending a lot of time. And he was appointed as the director of the uh, British Passport Control, which was already established in uh, the United States. So he, it was a simple thing for the British to just uh, appoint him as the new director of the British Passport Control. But of course, the, the real front of the building was the British Security Coordination, which he named his organization. But his problem was staffing. He could not, because uh, the United States was neutral, he could not hire uh, Americans and he needed a lot of staff. So what did he do? He came to Canada, put a small ad in the paper, wanted for the war effort women and uh, a phone number to, to call. And uh, from that one small ad, 1,500 local young women, Canadian women, aged 18 to 22, came from various parts of, of Canada and ended up working for Stevenson in New York. On his way over, and in fact, I, the funny thing is that on this subject, I just posted something on Facebook today about this very subject. I have a, a post on my uh, Facebook page where I each day post a, an excerpt from my books, including and the one I'm working on right now is, is the birth of special operations. So Stevenson in a meeting with Winston Churchill before coming over to back to North America, was briefed by their intelligence organization, SIS and MI6, MI5. And he was told that he needed to get these two fellows on site. Wild Bill Donovan of the uh, OSS, the COI, the forerunner of the OSS, and then ultimately the CIA. And uh, the next fellow I'll be talking about. But Donovan was a close liaison to President Roosevelt. Uh, they were good friends, and uh, he had uh, Roosevelt's trust. So he had to get uh, close to him, and they had to get close to the next fellow. That's J. Edgar Hoover, of course, of the FBI, a man who just uh, didn't like any of the uh, presidents that he had to work under. And that was because basically saying that, well, you know, what is a politician doing it, trying to tell me how to do police work? Right. So, so Stevenson said to J. Edgar Hoover, I'd like to have a meeting with you. And it was one of the first meetings he had. He met Hoover in his office, told him exactly what he would be doing in the United States. And uh, he had said, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to be uh, setting up a school in Canada, and I'd like you to, to bring some of your top guys up and observe the training that's going on there. I think he was very impressed by it. So when the camp opened, Hoover brought up a number of his FBI agents and observed the training, and he was really impressed by that. So he told Stevenson that he could have a free hand to operate in the United States. General Constantine is a Canadian um, general of World War II time. He was not very well known at the time, and he was not very well known to this day, as a matter of fact. I think I'm probably the only one who, that's ever written anything about him. But he played a, a critical role, and that was because he was responsible for one, Camp X, and the liaison between the, the British military and the Canadian military through Camp X and the BSC. And the other thing he had as a responsibility was uh, Britain's gold. He was the guy who was in charge of the safekeeping of Churchill's gold. And you can see here in this photograph on the left, this is a photograph that's never been published other than in my book. And wow. it's Winston wow. Churchill walking with uh, General Constantine at Niagara Falls. So it's, it's autographed Winston Churchill, Niagara Falls. And it says underneath that, it says, uh, to my dear friend, Connie. Uh, Connie is what he called him affectionately. And uh, they were, as I say, they were very good friends. But what you don't see in the photograph is Prime Minister Mackenzie King. And that's because Constantine and his boss, Defense Minister Ralston, had to keep it a secret from from them, from the prime minister, because of course, if, if it ever got out that what was going on at Camp X, it would become a political warfare, a political football in the in the parliament. So it was kept a, a secret even from the prime minister as to what was going on there. 
The photograph on the right is, that's a two military district in Toronto. And that, those are his staff, of course, presenting Constantine with an autographed uh, photo and frame photo of the, uh, the photograph on the left. And this is uh, General Constantine with uh, Colonel Sam McLaughlin, Colonel Sam McLaughlin of Oshawa, General Motors, Chairman of the Board of General Motors, uh, very wealthy man. This is at his Parkwood estate in, in Oshawa. He was one of the few outsiders who was trusted uh, by all those involved in Camp X. And the reason being, one, he was a good friend of many of them. And uh, number two, he provided the camp with uh, vehicles vehicles, military vehicles, right off the assembly line of General Motors. Tommy Drewbrook, he was appointed to the Canadian Director of the British Security Coordination out of Toronto. Again, a person that, that was a good friend of Stevenson's, could be trusted. He was a World War I soft with uh, camel uh, pilot with a number of kills and in the same group as, as William Stevenson. So they went back a long way, and he knew that he could, he could trust in Tommy. Again, one of the few outsiders of the military ranks, RCMP Commissioner George McClellan. He played a big role in the, in the BSC during the war. This information only came out recently through declassified documents that, that had been released that I have copies of. And to give you an example, these are just some of the things that his staff did, and, and they needed a lot of uh, manpower to do that. And that was to provide invaluable screening upon requests from the BSC when German regions were suspected of operating in Canada. They provided manpower for surveillance of all CampEx staff and agents when on leave. They provided security coverage for agents in training when they were out on simulated missions, which obviously was a big job. Casa Loma, of course, uh, everybody in Toronto knows about uh, Casa yeah. Loma, a very famous castle. And this is Station M, M stood for magic, played a big role. You'll read about it in a number of books, but it, it never tells you where Station M was for some strange reason. And I guess just because authors were not able to find out, it didn't appear in documents anywhere other than the, the name Station M. But basically, it's just to, to answer the question, what was Station M about? If you go to the, you know, look at the movies that Ian Fleming created for his character, James Bond, and you'll see Q walking around in his lab showing James Bond all the new toys and gadgets that he would have to use on, on his missions. Well, that's exactly what they did in Casa Loma. In the basement wow. of Casa Loma, they had a number of uh, scientists working. They had seamstresses, tailors from, from some of the famous places in, in Toronto, for example, and creating all kinds of things. So they made forged documents for the agents, passports, visas, letters of reference. They made incriminating letters on typewriters smuggled out of the countries where the agents would be sent. They made uh, civilian clothing using cloth, threads, buttons, again, smuggled out of those same countries. They made forged currencies of all Axis countries, and they made uh, secret messages using invisible ink. And again, at Casa Loma, seven years ago now, I went to the owners uh, of the castle and I asked them if for a meeting, and I put on a presentation for them, and two gentlemen, and, and I said, are you aware of the, of the historical uh, significance of Casa Loma with respect to World War II? And they weren't really aware of it other than the Queen's Own Rifle, which has an exhibit there. But I said, no, there was another aspect of it, and that was Station M. And so I explained to them, just I've explained to you what Station M was. And I said, how oh, would you like me to put together a, a Station M collection of my artifacts that I've acquired over the years? And they said, absolutely. So if you go to Casa Loma today, that's the, that's the exhibit that you'll see. And it's all kinds of James Bond uh, gadgets that were really used by the real agents during World War II. So Eric Kerwain, he was the chief recruitment officer. And um, his non de guerre was Bill, Bill Simpson. But I was lucky to meet Eric, track him down and found him in, in 1977. 
And we became very good friends. My wife and I would go over and spend uh, time with, on a Sunday with Eric and his wife, Vilma. And we'd, I'd play chess with him. And we'd talk about the war and we'd talk about BSC and we'd talk about Camp X. So a lot of the information that I have in my books came through Eric Kerwin. And as I mentioned, you know, as chief, chief recruitment officer, he recruited all of the uh, army guards. He recruited all of the staff. He recruited all of the agents who were to come through Camp X. So he knew just about everything that was going on there. And so in um, 1940, just after Stevenson had set up his operations in New York, it was now important to find a location for this top secret spy school that had to be in Canada, could not be in the United States again because they were neutral. So they found a small, small, <laughs> sorry, it's a large actually uh, farm on the shores of Lake Ontario called the Sinclair Estate. And uh, this house uh, and the farm itself, the area was called Glenrath by the Sinclair family, but it was 275 acres uh, of rolling fields overlooking the Lake Ontario. And it was perfect for what they were looking for. And it just so happened that it was available because the um, entire Sinclair family had passed on. And so Stevenson authorized the two gentlemen, Eric Kerwin and his boss, Tom, Tommy Dubrow, to go in and pay cash for the, for the estate, which they did paying $12,000 cash. And then by 1941, the September 41, they started constructing a number of buildings. Here you can see one of uh, two H buildings. They were, they were mirror images of each other. Each one of those windows represents a room that's 10 by 10. And there were rooms on, on two sides. There was a hallway down the center. Uh, there was a mess in the middle of the uh, building and one shared washroom. And then on the night of December the 6th, 1941, Commanding officer Roper Kalbeck in the middle with the kilt on arrived with his senior instructors, all of those gentlemen being experts in some kind of training exercise, i.e. Um, small arms, weaponry, combat, explosives training, Morse code, large weapons, uh, Sten guns, Bren guns, Tommy guns, you name it, it they, they covered everything. Oh, wow. And by, by 1943, the camp was fully operational. There you can see those two H buildings I was talking about. On the left-hand side, there's a communications building. Across the road from that, there's a, a, a CO's residence. And down at the far end, you can see the old uh, Sinclair uh, farmhouse and the uh, turnaround. And that's the Canadian team in 1943. By then, the commanding officer had changed. <clears throat> Roper called back going back to uh, England and uh, commanding officer Skilbeck uh, was now in charge. And th this photograph superimposes oh. where the building oh. buildings were and would have been if they were still there today as the whole area is, uh, is an industrial park now. As far as the training goes, once the camp was operational, this is a 90-foot jump tower. You would climb up that ladder at the back, stand on that platform, grab that rope, uh, swing down, hit bales of hay, drag your feet to slow your momentum, roll, release the rope and roll. And uh, that was your preliminary parachute training. And to show the importance of Camp X, the most talented silent killer in the world, William Fairburn, was 58 years of age when he was brought out of retirement and from England and sent directly to uh, Camp X, where he became the chief instructor. Here you can see him with one of the training exercises at the camp and the holds that he was teaching the agents. I just want to add that the, it's yeah. amazing reading through the books, just the extent of how many different training courses there were and how many i know you named a few but 
if you go through the book, it's just amazing whether it be dealing with weapons or explosives or, you know, behind enemy lines stuff. Yeah, it was, it's just amazing. I'm sure there's other stuff that we'll get into, but just to add, it's, it's incredible that they did so much in this facility. And when you think about the, the significance that all this training would have on the war, it's, it's just unbelievable. Very interesting. Yes, the syllabus for the uh, the camp was. I have a copy of it. It's a uh, it's a document that's about that thick. So wow. yeah, it's it's a lot more detailed than what I'm talking about. That's for sure. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, but I've read it thoroughly. It's very interesting to 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 read it. The techniques that they had and whatnot. So here you see some agents uh, on maneuvers. They would take them 40 miles north of here and drop them off and they had to find their way back to the camp by living off of the off of the land and following the creeks rivers back down to uh, lake ontario and they trained all year round so here you see oss agents uh, training at camp x in the winter time it's nice that they had i mean in the books you list a lot of benefits for the location of camp x so it one that I maybe you maybe you listed it, but maybe not. But just seeing this picture, it just makes me think that that's a, another great benefit that they had such a change in climate with regards to weather. Because obviously there were some terrains during uh, World War II that were very cold, right? So that's that's great. Yeah, yeah. They they had to they had to train all year round because uh, you just couldn't afford to wait for. Uh, the, the uh, springtime and summer to, uh, to train agents, it, it was nonstop. Again, here's a typical situation where you, you can see the snow on the tires. And uh, these are Yugoslavs, Canadian Yugoslavs, who are all being trained at the camp as a group. And that was, they, they did it that way <clears throat> as planned because they could. <clears throat> Excuse me. They had the camaraderie amongst themselves and they could speak their own language, which was Czechoslovakian or so Yugoslavian. And, and then, of course, they could speak English. So they were able to communicate with the instructors and their, their buddies. OK, so here's a tiger moth from Oshawa Airport, which was a uh, air training base for pilots. The uh, chief instructor had his own plane and. Here he is on a uh, bombing run, again, with live ammunition over the camp. And I mentioned explosives. They had a new product called RDX, which was is a plastique. And here they are uh, planting a charge down at the lake and then the detonation going off beside it. You had spoke to that as being one of their accomplishments as to developing that that new weapon or that new explosive and just them determining the best techniques in utilizing it. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Uh, it was developed in, in Czechoslovakia. Okay. Uh, so fortunately it was, it was developed by our side before Czechoslovakia was uh, occupied and they, and, and, and they mass produced after that, but it was very sought after because it was completely safe. You, you could carry it. It's, it's like plasticine and you could carry it in your pocket. You would never have to worry about it going off. Uh, you could uh, fire a gun through it, hit it with a baseball bat, whatever you want. And it would not, not go off. It required uh, a time pencil with the electrical charge that would detonate the, uh, the plastique. So it was uh, very sought after because it, it worked so great with uh, molding it to the undercarriage of a train or uh, a truck or something like that. It would just it, adhere to that, and then you wouldn't have to worry about it falling off and just blend right in with whatever it was that, that it was stuck to. So here you can see the old Sinclair farmhouse in the background. And this is training with uh, training a group with uh, Sten guns and Bren guns and small arms showing them how to hold the weapon for the best uh, results. And this too at the, is at the camp where they're uh, learning how to uh, not be detected when, when being searched. And they, they made the simulation as, uh, as realistic as, as possible, this being the result of uh, a fellow holding a, holding a weapon and uh, the other fellow has a long bayonet in his hand. Okay, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Poking through just like uh, the Green Escape, right? Just, just like the, the movies. Green. Yeah, just, right on. Yeah. That's where they that's where they got all that stuff from for the for the movies. Sure, sure. Yeah. These are OWI agents. The fellow with a cigarette in his mouth in the middle was a, a senior uh, representative of the OWI, which is the Office of War Information, which is psychological warfare. And uh, they, of course, were staff, senior senior staff. They they weren't agents themselves, but they were all headed to Camp X to watch a group of OWI agents being trained there. So off they went. And obviously, as you can see in civilian clothing, the fellow on the far right, the tall fellow, is yeah. Robert, Robert Sherwood. And Robert Sherwood was President Roosevelt's chief writer at that time. Of course, seconded to the OWI when, when the Americans entered the, the war. While they were watching the training, they always trained with live ammunition at Camp X. And uh, they were watching behind a, a sheet of uh, bulletproof glass and uh, two bullets collided, driving one bullet down through the top of uh, Frederick Boisevin, the fellow with the cigarette in his mouth, through the top of his head, killing him instantly. And uh, the photo on the right is his funeral at the uh, McIntosh Anderson funeral home in Oshawa. And then he was put into a hearse and driven down to uh, Peace Bridge, where they took him down to uh, back to the States where he's buried today. And a little known fact that people find interesting is the, the, the terminology uh, that the Americans use, the CIA uses of the, the farm. This document is a uh, death uh, certificate for... Another fellow who was accidentally shot through the head at the camp, Howard Benjamin Burgess. He was 26 years old. He came over from England as a chief instructor of Camp X, and he was only there six days when he was accidentally shot through the head. He's buried in the Union Cemetery in Oshawa today. And uh, but this document, which is signed by um, Colonel Kalbeck, which was the first commandant of the camp, under residence, it says Sinclair Farm. Well, in the early days, of course, the COI and the OWI, all Americans, were the first groups to come into Camp X for training. When the war broke out for the Americans, which was ironically right after the, the day that Camp X opened, they, of course, declared war on the Japanese, and from there, a number of these fellows were sent down to set up schools in, in Virginia for the OSS. And the Americans adopted the name The Farm because they, they liked the fact that it was just a perfect cover name for a secret camp. So they took that and they adopted that name. So then when you see modern day CIA movies where they say we're going to the farm for the oh, weekend yeah. training. Okay. I was just right? gonna ask you that, Lynn. So, I was gonna say it was yeah. yeah, okay. So, so that's where it came that it came so from the there. Ah. So the Americans today don't realize it, but every time they say they're going to the farm, they're really talking about Camp X. It's a Canadian term, basically. That's it's so a Canadian cool. term. That's yeah. great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Hydra operations uh, Pat Bailey. Uh, <laughs> A very famous Canadian, not fam famous in, in, in uh, history books, that's for sure. You won't read about him in any Canadian history books. But he was, I, I have to say, he was the most brilliant Canadian ever born. Next to him would have been William Stevenson. But Pat Bailey would have been the first because he developed from hand, from his own hands, the entire Hydra radio operations which was the link between Washington, New York, Camp, Camp X, and Bletchley Park in England. So when he had completed his operations of uh, building this state-of-the-art radio equipment, they were sending 12,000 messages per day between Camp X and Bletchley Park. A lot of those messages were sent because they were in German code, and they had to go through the Enigma code to be deciphered. That's the only way they could be deciphered. Okay, right. Which they had at Bletchley Park, of course. So that's why there was so much 
traffic going back and forth. But there was also traffic between Churchill and uh, Roosevelt now that Roosevelt was in the war. But uh, so here you can see a number of photographs of, of, of his operations. And he also developed the Rock X cipher machine that, that they used in 1943, 44, and, for, and part of 45. And it was, the code was never broken by the Japanese nor the, the Germans. So, and it was all developed from hand. Wow. Next. That's interesting. Just to add my, one of my best friends, his grandmother, she was very talented in, in that area when it came to using the Enigma machines. She was, I think she was one of the characters depicted in the movie, The Imitation Game. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. If you remember that movie? That's a good yeah. movie. Yes. Yeah, good movie. absolutely. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. And of course, Ian Fleming, Fleming was at Camp X in 1943. He not, not only was he deputy naval admiralty, but he was also in charge of a group that he commanded called AU 30 AU, which was a 30 assault unit. And these were what we would call Navy SEAL today. And so at the camp in, in August of 1943, he was at the camp uh, with, with his group of guys. And what they were doing was they were operating in Lake Ontario with uh, one man subs, and they were practicing putting limpid mines underneath the, the hull of a, a freighter, which they had moored off the camp, just off the shores. So he was there for that purpose. And, and while he was there, he befriended a fellow on the right Paul Dane. Paul Dane was the political warfare instructor, teaching them a psychological warfare. And they obviously became good friends because Paul Dane was a screenplay writer before the war. He wrote a number of screenplays, The Taming of the Shrew, Murder on the Orient Express. He wrote, he got an Academy Award in 1952 for a movie called Seven Days to Noon. And he wrote the screenplays to ultimately afterwards to the uh, all of the uh, ape movies the um, oh the planet of the apes uh, planet of the apes and the Re escape from the planet of the apes and, and those are the, the original ones right these, those are the original ones yeah. yes yeah That's wild. and if you take out if you take the uh, the movie uh, goldfinger from the library and look at the the back of it to for the credits you'll see that paul dane wrote the screenplay for the movie Goldfinger. That's so cool. And apparently, I mean, obviously he did, a, I mean, the movie's just wonderful in all shapes and forms, whether it's the shooting or the writing or the acting. But I, I looked it up and I read that it, like in, you know, in the social circles and the film critique circles, like it, it outperformed the book. It did better than the book. Apparently it did. It, it was just, the writing was stronger and it depicted a better mm -hmm. story. And I mean, it's, it's, that's so interesting that there's this connection that it's so unknown for such a, a well-known movie from such a well-known franchise. Yeah. And it's just, uh, I guess, a little ironic. The two of them met in a small mess inside the camp and nothing to do, but in the evenings, but sit around and, and have a beer and talk about what you're going to do after the war. The, the bottom uh, left-hand corner, that's me sitting in, yeah. the, uh, in the Aston Martin. That's so cool. And uh, that's at Camp X. Um, is it, oh, is it really? Yeah, that's at Camp X. The, the British brought it over in secrecy, and I wasn't allowed to tell anyone when they called me. There's a, there's a magazine called Top Gear okay. in Britain, and they sent it over. And it ended up going down to Arizona, where it was auctioned off. Shortly after that, just days after that, and it got, it went for five million dollars. And I think recently that same car was sold again for thirty million dollars. So, but anyway, that's that was uh, that was a, a great, great day that day. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Good for you, man. That's so yeah. awesome. It's also in, just to add one more thing to the Goldfinger piece. It's so interesting reading in in the book. I think it was the. Uh, birth of special operations book how they make the connection of in the movie how goldfinger has this essentially like a training camp with all these obscure tactics and different <laughs> training stuff and and i mean it's such a nod to to camp x it's it's just 
it's right in your face. It's unbelievable. It's so cool. Yeah, and obviously, uh, so many of the things in the early Bond movies, Dr. No and Goldfinger and a couple of others, you see a lot of what Ian Fleming learned at, at, at Camp X and from the agents themselves, from the training itself, from all the toys that, that he witnessed being used by the, by the agents. So, I mean, obviously, it, it all came together in, in his books. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the Station M connection with with Q and I mean those, those were some of the best scenes in in the classic in the classics yeah, yeah I mean I forget his I, I forget his name who played Q Dam, Damien was it or I forget yeah his name. I don't remember the original, name the original the yeah, original but I mean original, those were yeah, those those were just they were the best they were the one of the best scenes in the movies you'd wait and wait and see oh here comes the Q scene right let's mm-hmm. see the car let's see the gadgets let's hear some jokes and no, that's, I mean, just to think that some of these concepts came from, rooted from this little old camp in Canada. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's awesome. It is. It's an amazing story. Yeah. So here's Paul Dane again. Uh, this is at a school in, in England called Bewley. And uh, shortly after this, Paul, Paul Dane was sent to Camp X once camp was open. This would be probably in 1941, early 41. I'm going to say late 40, early 41. And the fellow standing beside him was the, the man who wrote the syllabus for Camp X. And he was very high up in the British, intel, uh, British uh, intelligence, SIS. And he was also an instructor uh, in political warfare at uh, this camp called Bewley. And of course, it's uh, none other than the notorious Kim Philby, the uh, Russian spy. So unbeknownst to Paul Dane, there he is talking with him and of course he had no idea of who yeah. he was wow that's so interesting that's cool that's cool they that got a picture of it too yeah uh so this is how they they got agents in behind enemy lines they would fly in a converted halifax bomber and it would fly at 20,000 feet then they would drop down to 2,000 feet over a drop zone parachute out the back Halifax would uh, carry on and the uh, agent would uh, hit the ground. They had a shovel on the back, dig a hole and bury their parachute and off they would go. This is, this is one of the actual maps that were used, uh, the drop zone in France. On the right hand side, you can see the coordinates of the drop zone. So those were written by the agent that was planning this? That, that, that would be written, well, that would be planning, that would be the- The handler? The, the handler, the, the head guy who was handling the mission. So this would be all be explained to them prior to going in, right? Yeah. So, so this is what he would be showing them and the coordinates. Coordinates, of course, are for the pilot eventually when they drop them on over the zone, right? So the next screen shows you that actual spot in a reconnaissance flight. So uh, there again is the field where he's going to be dropped. And then the arrow pointing north shows a small village. So he would head off that way using a compass and uh, go to that small village. And he would have been told to go to a street and a street number. And of course, there he would find a, a British safe house. And the preferred way of getting them into uh, France was in a Lysander aircraft. It uh, was short takeoff and landing. It would fly out of England off the coast, fly straight across to France, land in a farmer's field. They would be greeted by a resistance fighter and uh, the two agents, a male and a female carrying a suitcase were in civilian clothes, so they were spies. And the resistance fighter would take them off into the woods where they would join up with a a group of resistance fighters and begin their mission. The pilot would then jump in the plane, head back across the channel and land uh, safely on the other side and and with uh, no one being the wiser. And two fellows that you probably read about in my book, Joe Glennie and Andy Derwitz. Glennie was codenamed Gordon. Derwitz was codenamed Daniels. Uh, they were both very good friends of ours for many years. And uh, fortunately for, for us, they went on missions behind enemy lines, so they had a story to tell. 
And it was an exciting story because they were actually captured, both of them, and taken to an SOE prison and brutally tortured by the Gestapo for information. And then they planned an escape and escaped and uh, made it back through the MR, MI9 escape route through the Pyrenees, back to England, and then at the, at the end of the war, back to Canada, where they lived locally, the two of them. So I was able to meet up with them and spend a lot of time with them. And of course, that's why the, the two of them are featured in my book, because I was able to tell their complete story. Next. So cool. That's amazing. And uh, this, this guy, Reinhard Heydrich, he, he was the guy who was in charge of the, the, the whole thing, the, the, the interrogation of the agents, the, the SOE prisons, etc. The Butcher he was of Prague, also, right? Yeah, he was also, that's right, the Butcher of Prague. Yeah, he was also the mastermind of the, the final solution, the, the extermination of 6 million Jews. Really? Yeah, he, he was the guy, guy who, wow. this guy. Wow. Yeah, and uh, so he was, the, the British knew that he was 10 times worse than Hitler ever was. He was absolutely ruthless. He, this guy had no heart whatsoever or compassion whatsoever. And uh, it was all about getting the information and, and that was the end of it. So the British said, they recognized that upon Hitler's retirement, this guy was going to be number one. He was going to be the new chancellor. He was going Imagine. to be the head of, of the Nazi party. And uh, so they decided that they wanted him liquidated. So there's a movie that came out a few years ago. It's called Operation Anthropoid. Excellent movie. Tells the whole story. But they wanted them liquid, liquidated. They put a plan together. In fact, the man that I talked about, William Fairburn, the chief instructor of Camp X, trained, not at Camp X, but in Northern Scotland, trained the, the two men who would eventually go in behind uh, enemy lines uh, to assassinate uh, Reinhard Heydrich. And those two men were uh, Jan Kubis and Josef Gabzik. They were Czechoslovakian, SOE, and uh, one was 26, the other was 29. They were approached about this mission and they told them that if you decide to accept this mission, you will not come out alive. And they accepted the mission. They went into Prague. They successfully assassinated Reinhard Heydrich and they did not come out alive. And then back to artifacts and the Camp X collection and whatnot. In November next month, we're going to be opening a, a brand new exhibit at, actually it's called a museum now because it's the size of it but a new museum at uh, Casa Loma on the third floor in the uh, great room. And it will feature all of the Camp X artifacts that I've collected over the past 45 years. That is so cool. Yeah, so that's opening at Casa Loma next month. And I'm actually Beautiful. working on that right now. So it'll be, it'll be something to see. Absolutely. And that's it. Wonderful. That's the story. That's the story. That's great. Okay. So there, again, there is uh, one of your books, The Birth of Special Operations in Canada. I read that myself and it's, it's wonderful. And I do have, I do have a, a website, camp-x.com. Oh, sure. I'll pull that right. up. I'll pull that up real quick. Okay. Cause there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> additional information on there for people, especially kids who are doing, and I get a lot of them. I just did a, a Zoom uh, meeting with a college in North Carolina and they're doing a, a special paper on it. So I get a lot of those kind of things where, where people send me messages all the time. You can, you can email me uh, and ask me questions. But there's a, a students and, and at the top, back at the top, there's a uh, student and teacher's resource page. And on there, the first item, there's a number of things you can select. But the first one is a photo gallery. And then that, that's the history of Camp X, what was Camp X. So that's where I tell basically again, that same story. Wonderful. That's great. So, and then I, as, as I said, I have a Facebook page as well, which is Lynn Philip Hodgson. And I do excerpts daily from, from the birth of special operations. Awesome. That's great. Do you have a, a couple moments for a few quick questions? Yeah, certainly. Can you speak about Bowmanville or AKA Camp 30? Yeah. There's actually a link between Camp X and Camp 30. The commandant of Camp X, uh, Colonel Skillbeck, 
was actually sorry it was uh, it was a um, it wasn't Skillbeck it was uh, Cuthbert yeah I'm sorry I'm right it, it wasn't they got the called back and Skillbecks and they're <laughs> confusing at times but it was it was Cuthbert Skillbeck his name was he was the third commandant of the camp but he spoke fluent German and um, so often he would be called upon to go to Camp 30 which was the German POW camp in Bowmanville Ontario and he would be asked to go inside as a prisoner and act as a, a prisoner, which was very dangerous work, of course, when you're spying on the Germans within their own camp. And, and he would be sent in to find out information on a particular individual. Could be somebody who worked on an, a U-boat machine that, or submarine that they wanted to know about, or they worked on Messerschmitts or, or whatever the situation was. So he would be sent in to spy on them and try and get information out of them that the British needed. So he would do that often. As you can see by your scrolling through, there were these were all senior German officers. They're all officers, including three generals, high-ranking German generals. And of course, the, the Germans wanted these guys back. They wanted them out of there. They wanted them released, and they wanted them back in the war. So they arranged for a number of escapes. So some of them are, are, are talked about on that page that you just had up. And uh, some great stories of, of some of the escapes that took place. Collaboration with the, the Americans, with the, with the Germans when they were neutral. And uh, in fact, there's, there, there, there's a famous uh, story about two Americans who were restaurateurs in Chicago who were put to death over, uh, over one of the escapes and, and hiding one of the agents while they were in transit. So it's a very interesting story as well. I wrote a book on it called the Camp 30 Word of Honor. And it depicts all of the events that, that took place there, actual events that took place. And I was able to write it through two German officers who I befriended after the war and who were at Camp 30. And one was a Messerschmitt pilot shot down over, uh, over London during the Battle of Britain. And the other one was on the famous U-boat U-99. So they were, of course, able to air verify all of the stories that I was given. Interesting. Can you also <clears throat> talk about the Defense Industries Limited and its relevance to Ajax, the city of Ajax? Yeah. Yes. The, the town of Ajax is only a few miles from here, from Whitby, where I live. And uh, DIL, Defense Industries Limited, was created overnight. It's actually opened on the same month that, that Camp X and Bowmanville opened, which was December of 1941. But it grew up overnight. Prior to that, it was South Pickering. And all of a sudden, it became a very large town. And 9,000 Canadian women worked there. They worked uh, shift work. The husbands worked shift work at General Motors manufacturing army vehicles so one would be at work while the other was home looking at the kids and and vice versa but yes nine thousand, and they 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 filled over 40 million shells during the war so many of those those shells being used actually to to win the war without without those 40 million shells i i can't imagine what would could have happened that's interesting they had such a such a great operation going on like such a grand operation going on and they kept so much of it secret it's it's unbelievable with regards to the opening date of camp x is there do you find it suspicious with the how the dates align with the date of the pearl harbor attack do you think that they knew some people knew that that was going to happen and they knew that the camp would be needed to to start getting Americans involved or start getting more people trained or anything? Yeah, I, I, I think it's probably the opposite uh, to that. I think it's probably, uh, it was a freak coincidence okay. that that 12 hours later after the camp opened, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. So the, the two didn't have a, a link. And the reason why they we know they didn't have a link is because the camp was set up to train Americans solely. And they were going to come across the uh, Lake Ontario. That's another reason why the, the camp was there, placed there. 
they were gonna, they were going to come across the the lake under the cover of darkness and land right on the beach inside Camp X. So that was all set up. All that changed overnight as soon as Pearl Harbor happened. Roosevelt declared war on the Japanese. Now they were free to drive up in an army vehicle, drive up in uniforms, fly into Oshawa Airport, take the train to Union Station and be picked up by a, a staff car uh, and driven to Camp X. So it was, it was a, a, a freak coincidence that uh, it happened because if the, if the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, let's say six to eight months prior to that, they wouldn't have opened up Camp X because they immediately had this, the instructors, some of the instructors leave, Fairburn was one of them, leave the camp. They brought over new instructors from England for Camp X and Fairburn had to go down and establish all of the American camps because the Americans had nothing like this, absolutely nothing like this. So he had to start from scratch and, and they had to hurry because they were way behind. But there is on the other side of it, though, there are there's there's a lot of a uh, lot of uh, things written about Roosevelt's involvement in uh, Pearl Harbor and the fact that he may have sacrificed the lives at Pearl Harbor to get the Americans into the Second World War. He knew that that once the attack happened, they would declare war on Japan. That would be his in to do that. He wanted into the war a big time, but wasn't allowed to under the Neutrality Act. And of course, it's the old thing of the Republicans versus the Democrats, and it's all politics. So his hands were tied. But there's a number of things that have been published. One's a book called Spy Counter Spy by uh, Dusko Popov, Tricycle was his code name, and he was a triple spy. And he told, in his book, he told J. Edgar Hoover, before the attack that the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor. And Hoover kicked him out of his office. He basically said, I don't need a foreigner coming in here telling me how to run my business. And of course it came true. Yeah, sounds like yeah. Hoover. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Do you, do you think that the story of Camp X deserves to be in the history books? The, of course it does. There is one book that's in grade 10, they have a history book that has a one page, just simply one page on Camp X. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it, it did that happen a few not years enough. ago. It's not enough. It doesn't tell the whole story, of course. But for years and years and years, there's been nothing on the subject at all. And it's, you know, it's a shame that they don't teach it, but that's the way it is. And especially now with this cancel culture thing that's going on, likely will never happen. It'll make it much more difficult, sure. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, on that note, I know you mentioned a few, but it's probably worth it just to repeat them. But where where can people find any memorials or exhibits or presentations? I know you mentioned a few, but are there any others? I do walking tours, but with uh, COVID. I do uh, Doors Open Oshawa and Doors Open Whitby. One's in the spring, one's in the fall. They, they have been suspended for two years. They were very popular. I had, I, over the past uh, 20 years, I have taken, I'm going to say, easily 7,000 people through there. And uh, so it's very popular. There is a, there is a, a note of it on my site about the, uh, the walking tours. You can read a little bit about it. I think there's a couple of videos there too, but when it's going to start up again, I don't know, whenever this COVID thing is over. So that's one thing, but you can go there today. I just had a, a, a crew come up from Mexico City and interviewed me at the, at the camp, and they were dealing with the Mexico's involvement in the BSC. Okay. Because of course they had sub-agents in, in Mexico as they did all of Central and South America. So they were interested in, in pursuing that, and that's why they were they were up here. So there are a lot of things going on. We have we opened up just a few months ago the intrepid uh, statue, the new intrepid statue in Whitby outside of the uh, library, and it's a full statue, bronze statue, with a giant X 
And uh, on the X are uh, 3,500 words telling the story of uh, Stevenson and his BSc. And uh, so I, I wrote all of those words on the, on the X. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. So there's that. And there's, uh, of course, as I mentioned, uh, Casa Loma, the exhibits at, at Casa Loma. So there's a number of things that are being, being kept. And uh, the extra museum piece that you mentioned that opens in November? Casa right. Loma? Yeah, that'll, that'll be open uh, next month, and it's going to be quite impressive. Very impressive. That's that's I'm I'm very excited to check that out because yeah. in your books when you talk about the lecture hall and all of the paraphernalia and disguises and stuff that they they had from Germans that they they would confiscate from from right. Bowmanville and such. I thought that was a very interesting. Uh, part of the book so it would be really cool to see I mean some of that or just anything related to the story and camp it it would be really cool to see some of that stuff yeah it's so. uh, it's all there awesome great all right Lynn well thank you so much for coming in I appreciate your time it's such an interesting story I'm sure many people are going to enjoy it so thank you so much for coming in I hope we can get you back but I'm definitely going to have to come check out the camp sometime. So I definitely will be in touch. So if there's anything you ever need, please let me know. But, you know, if anyone wants to check out your websites or your books, again, Inside Camp X, that was that was just a wonderful book. And then the other one that you referenced a lot, the, the birth of special operations in Canada, that was an excellent read as well. I'm super excited to check out the website and, and look into more of some of this stuff because that stuff's great. And I'm definitely going to have to come check out the museum and stuff. Thank you. And uh, thanks for the interview. All, all the best all right, to Jordan. you. Okay. All right. all right. Thanks, Jordan. No, thank you so much. I appreciated that. Take care. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.